So uh, I'm Robert Martin from Google, and uh, I'm joined by my friend uh, Simon Prothero from Square Enix. And today we're going to be talking about uh, unlocking the value of data for your games. So the first half of the talk uh, is going to be primarily around architecture uh, and around simplification and scaling of analytics for large global games. Uh, and then the second part of the presentation will be Simon talking about some of the really incredible uh, analysis that Square has been doing around uh, several of their games. So uh, who went to the, uh, to the Stadia announcement yesterday or who watched it online? Everybody excited about that? We're very excited to be adding another logo up there to all the awesome consumer services that, that Google is launching. And uh, we're obviously most excited about gaming. So uh, Google Cloud, in particular, uh, we view ourselves as sort of the hub that joins a lot of those other services together and helps you integrate them and bring value uh, across all of those different Google offerings. And we have sort of four pillars that we're very passionate about. Number one is cross-platform and cross-play. And uh, the way that we accomplish that is by abstracting away a lot of the technology so that you can focus on games and data and analytics and ultimately customer experiences. We also are very committed to open source and open standards, and you'll see some of that today. And that's pretty different than what you see in, in gaming solutions uh, that you can find elsewhere. Uh, ML and data analytics, obviously a strong area of expertise for Google, uh, and we'll, we'll tap into that a little bit this afternoon. And I think that first slide did a, a good job of uh, of sort of laying out that one Google picture and all the different ways that we can help you. So machine learning. Uh, one of the really interesting challenges about machine learning, you know, everyone wants to take their games into this realm so that they can provide more customized experiences, so that they can more effectively monetize their games. But it's really challenging to unlock the insights from your data with machine learning because there just aren't that many data scientists. There's 21 million of us developers but there's only about a million data scientists worldwide, and there's only about several thousand deep learning researchers, and most of them probably work for Google. So when you're thinking about uh, unlocking insights with machine learning, you need to get the infrastructure and the technology out of the way of the data scientists, and you need to bring developers into that type of analysis. And so if you think about traditional data and analytics, um, a majority of the time is really spent supporting, scaling, and tuning the infrastructure that's necessary to process data at large scale. So you actually spend a minority of your, of your team's time focused on insights. And at Google, we ran into the same problem uh, years ago, actually, as we tried to scale up. And we sort of wanted to flip that equation on its head and have our developers and our data scientists spending most of their time on analysis and insights and a minority of time really thinking about infrastructure. So that'll sort of inform a lot of what we're going to talk about here today. So this is Google's journey uh, through big data processing, all the way back to about 2002, 2004 timeframe, where we invented distributed file systems, and we also invented the MapReduce algorithm. So that, for us, allowed us to unlock all the consumer-level data that we were, that we were collecting uh, with all of our consumer-facing products. But we very quickly outgrew MapReduce's ability to scale. And so in 2008, we invented a data processing engine called Dremel that greatly uh, sort of altered the path as far as how we built a data processing pipeline. And we're going to dig into that today. So if you look at that center lane on the slide, that's essentially sort of G G Google's journey internally to modernize its data processing capabilities. But along the way, I mentioned we're committed to open source. So we've been surfacing a lot of that software for you as open source APIs. So things like Hadoop, HBase, Apache Drill, and even TensorFlow. Now the really exciting part, I think, about what we're doing today is that we're surfacing not only the software as open source, but all of that infrastructure that we're using internally to power it as Google Cloud. And so we'll talk about that in a little bit, a little bit later. So what does a data pipeline look like on GCP? What do we mean when we've abstracted all the infrastructure away? So if you've done data processing in sort of a Hadoop-based ecosystem, you're familiar with a lot of different programming models, a lot of different tools, and a lot of different sort of layered solutions to try and achieve you know, real-time performance and scale. When you abstract the infrastructure away and you write the solution from the beginning for scale, it becomes a very simple picture. 
So our data pipeline has three primary components. If you want to stream data from a game, you broadcast to our global message bus, which we call PubSub. Think of it as a global serverless Kafka. Then you need to take that data, you need to transform it into a shape that's suitable for storage, and that's what we call data flow. And data flow takes your Java or Python code and scales it up as, as high as it needs to go to process the incoming messages from that data pipeline. And then the final sort of storage area is BigQuery, and that's our serverless data warehouse. And that's what we're gonna actually focus on most today. So three very simple components that all scale and all require zero infrastructure management. So this is what the reference architecture for a gaming solution looks like built on that data pipeline. So at the center of the picture, you've got BigQuery, which is just a data warehouse with tables and views like any that you're, you're used to using with SQL. Uh, the primary difference is how it can scale, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Up at the top, you've got your game clients and your game servers that are streaming data over to the right, and we're ingesting that data with PubSub, transforming it with Dataflow, and storing it into BigQuery. Now, you also need to do batch ingestion in many cases. You might have log files, you might have chat transcripts that you wanna drop off of your servers or your clients, and you can pull that in in a batch methodology through cloud storage, also using Dataflow. So whether you're streaming or you're batching your data, you're using the same programming model in both cases and the same scaling model. So let's dig into BigQuery a little bit more deeply. This is where things get a little bit interesting. So you know, if, you know, if you're familiar with traditional architectures for processing data, you have a collection of nodes, and each node is generally responsible for compute and for storage. With BigQuery, what we did is we realized that couldn't scale because sometimes you have massive quantities of data that you want to store cost efficiently, and other times you have extremely complex queries that you want to run. And those two things don't always scale together. And in the traditional model, you had to scale them together. So the first thing we did when we designed Dremel, which became BigQuery, is we separated compute from storage. Now you might say, you just broke the fundamental rule of data processing, keep data and compute close to each other. And so we couldn't just separate compute and storage. We had to connect them back together with an extremely fast network. So we actually have a petabit scale network that sits in between our compute and storage, which allows us to shuffle data extremely quickly. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. So there's some pretty exotic technology that's powering BigQuery, but the interface to it is the same SQL that you can use in MySQL or SQL Server or Postgres, whatever you're used to. So we also store the data in sort of an interesting way. So BigQuery is a relational database. Generally in a rela relational database, rows and columns of data are stored together. Because we have that petabit network, we can take the columns in your database and break them apart as well. And that allows us to do some interesting things as far as how we process the data and how we optimize the data. So we take the best of NoSQL databases and apply that architecture to a relational database. And that petabit network allows us to take columns from one table or from multiple tables that we're joining and put them back together very quickly. So we process a lot of sensitive data at Google. Think of your Gmail uh, documents and Drive documents and Sheets and all the metadata associated with that. We would never store your data without high-grade encryption. And so in BigQuery, that same high-grade encryption is available to you. Each one of those columns is actually encrypted with a separate encryption key, which is in, in response also encrypted with a key, in, key encryption key. And we rotate all of those keys for you. So the encryption piece is there, but it's also abstracted as well, so you don't have to worry about it. So we've talked about kind of the architecture of BigQuery. You might be saying to yourself, well, this sounds pretty cool, but you know, it sounds like a lot like other things that are out there. Um, one of the things that I want to really communicate today is the scale of BigQuery. So when you think about BigQuery, this is not just a cluster that's running in a data center. BigQuery is the data center itself. Data, our data centers are built around the capability to deliver data at scale. So when you create a data set in BigQuery, there are actually three facilities like this that are managing all of the data that you're storing. Your data is replicated automatically to all three of those facilities. Well, you might look at that picture and say, all right, Robert, so 
there's still just a cluster running in there, right? Like, it's a big building, but there's a cluster, and that's BigQuery. I wanna give you a specific example of what I mean when I say we build our facilities around BigQuery. So remember I mentioned that petabit network. A petabit is a million times faster than a gigabit network. How did Google create a network that's a million times faster than what you generally see out there? This is how. So to build a petabit network, we took 100,000 10 gig E links and combined them into a fabric. So this picture shows you a small piece of that fabric that's in each one of those three facilities. This piece of equipment is the length of a football field in each one of those facilities. That's what allows us to shuffle data back and forth at scale on petabyte size data sets. One other thing I wanna talk about briefly, and then we're actually gonna, gonna get hands on here and, and take a look at what BigQuery can do live. I wanna talk a little bit about machine learning. So not only has Google built purpose-built hardware to store and process your data, we also have built purpose-built hardware to build, train, and run inference on your machine learning models. Now again, why did we do this? I mean, there, so there are GPUs out there. We have GPUs in our data centers. Why go and build custom silicon to train and run predictions? The reason is simple. Again, it's scale. We need to be able to constantly iterate. So if you ever use something like Smart Reply in Gmail, you might notice that it just seems to get better every few weeks. And it's because we're allowed to, we can constantly iterate and retrain our models because the silicon that's built specifically for machine learning is 15 to 30 times faster. So faster is good, but also remember that most of our products that are consumer facing are free. So it also needs to be cost effective. So we get 30 to 80 times the operations per watt as we would get on a GPU. That means less power consumption and less heat. Now how do we do that? How is it that this, that this chip is so much faster? Well, if you think about a GPU, a GPU is designed to perform one vector operation per clock cycle. If you think about training a machine learning model, you're working on matrices. So if you wanna do a matrix operation on a GPU, you have to iterate across every row of that matrix. So that's multiple clock cycles to effectively perform one operation. Our tensor processor units are matrix processing. So each tick of the clock, we can process an entire matrix operation. So that's how we're able to train faster and more cost effectively. And so now I'd like to jump into the console and we'll take a quick look at uh, what BigQuery can do at scale. So I just happened to have a petabyte of data laying around and uh, I thought we might run a couple of SQL queries on a petabyte while I'm up here. So uh, this data set uh, is, is 1.09 petabytes. Uh, we have a trillion rows in this table stored, um, and we're gonna run a SQL query on it. So the first thing I, I wanna do is, is, in case you haven't worked with BigQuery, let's take a quick look at the structure. So BigQuery is just like any relational database. You have tables that have columns. So we have a set of columns here just like you'd have in MySQL. Uh, we've got familiar ANSI data types here. So very familiar, when we talk about simplifying the interface and empowering your data scientists, this is what we mean. This looks like a typical SQL database. So let's take a quick look at the data. So this is a preview here, but you can see that the data is arranged in exactly the same way that it would be arranged in any database that your data scientists have been using. So we're providing a really simple interface to some very powerful infrastructure on the back end. So that's cool, that's kind of a quick preview of what a table looks like in BigQuery. Let's go ahead and take a look at what, it, what running a query looks like. Let's see if I can zoom in here a little bit. So you can see this query a little better. All right, so we're gonna do a select query. Uh, we're gonna do uh, a, a select query on the sales partition table. Again, it's a, it's a trillion rows. We're gonna round and sum one of the columns. We're going to do a group by, so we're gonna be aggregating the data. And we're also gonna be sorting all of that data on all trillion rows. Uh, we're also gonna be doing a search for a specific customer key. And because we don't require you to do things like indexes in BigQuery, in fact, they don't even exist in BigQuery, we're gonna do a full table scan on a trillion rows when I run this query. 
So I'm gonna zoom out, and let's go ahead and kick this query off. So I just say run query, and our query is gonna start processing. Now let me give you an idea of what's happening here. So we're gonna go and select those two tablets for those two columns that I'm querying, pull them out of storage, and we're gonna shuffle them across that petabit network to the compute nodes. The first thing the compute nodes are gonna do is got two tablets that it has to decrypt, all trillion rows in each one. Then we're gonna decompress the data at about four to one. So the data is gonna get about four times as big as it was in storage. And then our worker nodes are gonna look at the instructions in the query and begin executing those. And so that's what's happening sort of seamlessly as we're processing this query. If I was to do a select star on this same table, it would run in about the same amount of time because we just scale the workers out horizontally and that's happening automatically. So this isn't gonna take long to run, but I'm a little bit impatient and I like to spend my time doing productive things. So let's jump over and do something else while we're waiting. So I'm gonna show you BigQuery's ability to train machine learning models in SQL, okay? So if you can see this query, this is another data set that I have, and this contains birth data for babies. And we're gonna build a model that'll allow us to predict the birth weight of babies based on some characteristics about those births. Now this could be useful for a game, but you could just as easily use the same technique to train a player lifetime value model or a player toxicity model, same techniques. So let's take a look here. The first thing I'm gonna do is just a standard query to pull the attributes that I wanna train my model on as well as the label that I'm trying to train. So I'm gonna pull a few items about the birth and then I'm gonna pull the weight, standard query. Now, to train a machine learning model, I have a bit of additional SQL up here that says take the output of that query and feed it into a linear regression, okay? So let's go ahead and kick off a training job on this linear regression model. And so again, the same workflow is happening here. BigQuery goes out, calls the data up from storage, shuffles it across that petabit network, and now instead of performing query operations, those exact same workers are adjusting weights on all of those input variables to optimize the performance of that linear regression model. And this should finish up here in just a few seconds. Okay, so we're done. 27 seconds, we trained a machine learning model on four gigs of data. So that's step one, training the model. Step two for your data scientists is evaluating the model, right? So we need to see how well that, that iteration of our model performed. Maybe we need some additional input values to be able to accurately predict baby weight. So again, I'm gonna run another sort of vanilla SQL query here. Let's pull up all of the values we fed into the training model. But now, with a bit of additional SQL up here at the top, Let's ask BigQuery to evaluate our model performance on our predicted baby weights versus the ones that are stored in our training data set. So this will just take a few seconds here. Okay, so now what I'm gonna show you, we get some nice statistics back. So our data scientists want mean squared error and they want R squared because that's what tells them how well this model is performing. So in this case, we've got an R squared of about 5%. We got some work left to do to bring in some additional data points so that we get really nice, accurate baby weights. But I've got the information that I need immediately to make those adjustments. So the final step in training our machine learning model is running predictions. So to run predictions with our fully trained model now, we run a SQL query that simply pulls up the input values to the model and our predict function will return our predicted baby weights. So let's run that real quick. And this should only take a few seconds here. Okay, so we processed four gigs of data there, five seconds, and uh, we returned 220,000 predicted baby weights. So in the amount of time that it took for me to start up a select query on a trillion rows, we were able to train, evaluate, and run predictions on a machine learning model. So this is what we mean about getting out of the way, getting the infrastructure out of the way of your very talented and very scarce and in-demand folks on your team. Let's go check back in on our trillion row table scan. And it's done. Uh, it ran in about two and a half minutes. We processed 32 terabytes of data on those two columns. And here are our total sales uh, aggregated by day and sorted for us.
What do you think? Not bad. That would take a pretty big spark cluster to be able to do that. You probably wouldn't want to pay the bill for it. So let's jump back over to uh, our slides, and, and I'd like to close um, by talking a little bit about a customer that has taken the full journey, and that's King. We actually have published a, a white paper with them. They have taken full advantage at scale of this infrastructure, and when I mean at scale, they're processing 50 billion events per day. So you might be saying to yourself, you know, that stuff is, that scale is amazing, but we're not there yet. What I would say to you is, everyone needs simplicity. You know, who would want to have to spend their time managing infrastructure if they didn't have to? And number two, scale is coming. So mobile and console are converging. The scale of mobile data is coming to console, right? And we also have hyper-casual, that's a new emergent genre, which generates massive quantities of data. So you need the simplicity today, and even if you don't have the scale today, tomorrow the scale will be there, and it's coming faster than you think. So at this point, I'd love to introduce, uh, I'd love to introduce Simon from Square Enix, and he will talk about some of the really fascinating uh, analyses that they're doing from the business side on their data with BigQuery. Thank you. Great, well thanks Robert, and um, thanks to Google for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing at Square Enix for the last um, couple of years. Uh, hopefully Square Enix doesn't need much of an introduction for a GDC audience. Uh, in case you're new to the industry, uh, we're one of the leading developers and publishers of games uh, across the world. We're known most for uh, big AAA franchises such as Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, Kingdom Hearts, Tomb Raider, Space Invaders. Uh, but we actually have um, a very broad portfolio of games on pretty much any gaming platform and any business model. Um, and uh, that's something I want to talk about a little bit about today. Um, a little bit about me. I joined Square in, well, I joined IDOS as a small startup in 1993. Um, and at the time, we were six guys in a boathouse uh, on the River Thames, about a mile upstream from Henry VIII's palace at Hampton Court. Uh, things have obviously changed quite a bit in the last 25 years. Um, and I've spent most of that time in a number of different roles within first IDOS, and then after it was bought by Square Enix, uh, in a, a, a number of different roles, really looking at the boundary between uh, business and technology development, um, and where new technology enables us to grow our business into new markets, new platforms, new business models, and so on. Uh, and that's how we end up today looking at uh, what we're doing with big data and uh, how we're addressing that kind of challenge. Um, I happen to be the guy that's standing up here talking about this. There is, if not a cast of thousands, a cast of dozens of people uh, behind me that have, have contributed to this work. Very little of it is actually my hands-on typing. Um, there's tiny bits of code. The guys try to keep me away from anything to do with production code these days. Uh, but we've got a very strong team, uh, both on the data engineering side, that have built this system, on the analytics and insight side, looking at working with the data, and then working across the company with game teams, marketing teams, brand teams, and so on. Um, I'll try and mention those as, as we go through, but anybody I'll forget, then my huge apologies, and I'll buy you a beer later. So, if we look at, uh, at what we're doing with big data, we've got a number of challenges, both business and technical. Um, both Square Enix and IDOS um, have been collecting data in a fairly determined way for about 10 years, um, since before uh, Square bought IDOS. Um, and although we've been collecting data in a, in a you know, concerted way, it hasn't been in a particularly organized way. Um, so what we've got is, or what we had, uh, is a lot of silos of data of different kinds. We had a lot of game telemetry, um, but that tended to be grouped into uh, different types of games. Games developed in Japan, games developed in the West, games using one technology suite versus another. Um, some games, the game data was entirely held within the game team, others it was centralized, uh, but really quite fragmented. And then we had a lot of other sources of data around our customers, uh, web analytics data, uh, showing their interaction with us across a range of different websites, the Square Enix website, but also individual game sites and so on. Um, any interactivity with our CRM system, if you click on an email, open an email, that data is, is logged and tracked, but again, in a separate system. Similarly, purchase data, 
social media interactions, resident registration data, uh, a whole bunch of different sources of data. And they were all stored across a number of different teams by different people using different technologies. Some of it, for example, was in a third party system like Google Analytics. Um, in some cases, it was in a SQL Server database, in others, Oracle, and others, MySQL. Um, sometimes it was sitting under some guy's desk, other times it was in a data center, but it was really a pretty fragmented picture. Um, and that led to a number of technical challenges. So about five, six years ago, we started trying to pull this data together, um, at least the game telemetry side of it, um, and uh, build what was at the time a, a kind of state-of-the-art solution for being able to analyze that data. Uh, we had a, a large on, well, not large, large, but a, for us, large on-prem Hadoop cluster in a data center in Montreal. Um, it was using licensed software, licensed per node. And that gave us a challenge that uh, we didn't really have the scalability that we wanted. The, to, to increase uh, the capacity of that cluster meant adding a whole node. And that was you know, roughly $20,000 or so. So it wasn't a trivial business decision to add a, no a node to that cluster. And that was a pretty much a one-way scaling operation as well. Once we scaled up, um, we were committed. We bought the hardware. We, you know, it was an annual license fee for the software. So we weren't really able to scale back down. So if we weren't convinced we were going to use that hardware for more than you know, a, sh a short term, then it was very difficult to justify making the investment in scaling. Um, in parallel with that, so we were running at, you know, most of the time we were running at capacity with whatever the, the capacity of that cluster was. Occasionally we would scale it up, but we're running at capacity, and it meant the data engineering team spent all their time spinning plates or, you know, juggling firing chainsaws or something like that to try and keep things from falling over. Um, they were optimizing the way in which the data was stored, making sure that we were, you know, evicting old data. Uh, and the problem was that they were spending all their time managing that cluster and managing the data rather than actually doing anything that was genuinely of value to the business. And also, uh, you know, that, that demo from Robert a minute ago was fascinating because we just couldn't do something like that. We weren't able to, you know, we had data, data scientists, again, very talented guys who were really keen to do a lot of experimentation with machine learning models, but we just couldn't do that. We couldn't take... Uh, you know, a large volume of data and throw a thousand cores of CPU at it over 48 hours to do some massive training job because we just didn't have the resources. So, what we wanted to do was to kind of completely reboot our data handling infrastructure. Um, a colleague of mine, Tim Ward, who heads up the analytics and insights team, uh, spent a lot of time going around the whole business, speaking to pretty much every uh, stakeholder, um, from all the teams across the business, all the locations, uh, various levels of the organization, and we put together a pretty comprehensive list of requirements. And a few kind of themes came out of that. The overall top vision that we're aiming for is what we call a single game of view. By analogy with you know, retail FMCG companies that have single customer views, we wanted a single game of view that gave us a holistic view of a gamer's interaction with us across everything that we, we could capture. So, Gameplay data on a, on a range of different formats, um, commercial data, marketing data, social media, and everything. But putting all of that together and represented by a single identity so that we knew that this person on Facebook was that person on our email database, this player on Xbox Live, that guy on Steam, this guy on Nintendo Switch. So putting all of that data together. And there were a few other sort of lower level themes. So the first is that. Um, the big driver for this was that we needed it to be scalable in a cost-effective way to enable us to do that kind of business experimentation that was difficult for us before. We also, given the life cycle of a game and uh, the way in which our game teams worked, we wanted this to be a very flexible solution, something that we weren't setting in stone today, how that data has to look for the next three, five years. Um, during development, game schema will, will often change. The, the types of data that you want to collect, collect changes. Uh, we'll also potentially add ad additional sources of data um, as the game is released and you've got DLC drops and kind of continuing evolution of the game, you will again want to, to be able to flex the, the data that you're capturing. Uh, and that goes for other sources of, of capture as well. So we wanted to be able to, to augment that data and to process it on the fly without having to kind of you know, tear down pipelines and rebuild them and so on. Um, and finally, uh, pulling all of that data together represents a huge opportunity for us from a business perspective, but it's also obviously a pretty significant risk. The more data we're bringing together, the more we're exposing ourselves to 
the risks of uh, data which was previously anonymized becoming PII because it's, you know, we're connecting it all together. Um, and it represents a pretty high value target. So we needed to make sure that we had the internal protections and controls around that data and the good kind of governance policies around it to keep our data protection officer kind of happy and smiling. So, um, spoiler alert, we ended up partnering with uh, Google Cloud. Let's just grab that water. Excuse me. Um, no big surprise there, but it wasn't a foregone conclusion. Um, we, once we'd gathered all those um, requirements, we then uh, spent some time with all the major public cloud providers uh, and a number of more bespoke specialist companies that offered solutions, uh, in some cases tailored to games, in some cases more kind of single customer view type solutions. Um, we brought them in, we sat them down, showed them our problem, talked a little bit about the, the current challenges we faced, and asked them you know, what, what they could do to help. And we had a number of different approaches. Um, some of them were, we can build this for you, we've got a professional service organization full of experts and we can just give you a solution to this. And that's explicitly not what we wanted. Um, we ended up going with Google Cloud, to cut a long story short, um, for a number of reasons. As Robert's pointed out, the technology is, is you know, stunningly excellent. Um, on the network side, for example, we, as part of, we, we built proof of concepts, proofs of concept on um, a number of those platforms. We, obviously, there's no point in doing a proof of concept for scalability if you're just working with the amount of data you can copy around in a spreadsheet. So we were using not pet, petabytes of data, but tens of terabytes of data as, as a test set. Um, and getting that data into the, the vendor's kind of architecture and moving it around uh, was lightning fast with Google. It was really not a challenge at all. It took a couple of hours to upload the data, and then once it's in GCP, it's pretty much instant to move around. Um, with some other vendors, it took many, many hours, sometimes even a small number of days, and in some cases, we never got there. Um, so just the, the fundamental basics of the, of the architecture um, knocked us out of the park from day one. Um, the other thing is that uh, for us, Google felt like a good cultural fit. Um, and I think that's probably common to a lot of games companies. We're completely happy with guys turning up uh, in t-shirts and uh, just talking tech from day one. Um, we're actually less happy with people turning up in smart suits and giving us polished sales presentations. Not true for every, every industry, but for us, the, the people that we met at Google um, from account management through tech support, through solutions engineering and so on, um, felt like a, a, a good match for the teams that we had and the, the kind of people that we had on our side working on this project. Um, and finally, it felt as though this was you know, something that they were going to help us to build rather than something they were gonna build and sell us. And that's a really important point. Um, of course, the, the fundamental thing that we, we build is great games, and that's, you know, our business lives or dies by making fantastic games, obviously. But that is becoming, in over, you know, over time, that is becoming to be not enough. Um, we need to have a, a kind of transformational approach to the way we handle data, um, and this represented a big strategic platform for us to, to do that. And so, it was really important that we felt that we had ownership of that. We've got some phenomenal engineers uh, on, on the team who worked on this. A couple of them are here today, but there's plenty of others back in London, LA, Montreal, um, who have worked on this platform. And we wanted to feel that, that those guys owned this platform, that understood it, and that we weren't going to be relying on third-party external companies every time we needed changes or something. We needed to feel that this was something that we had control of from day one. Um, and the other point is that uh, the, the Google sort of platform in general felt very integrated. Um, there are you know, other providers, some of the platforms felt a little bit disjoint. Uh, with Google, we didn't feel that. That was actually a bit of a surprise. The engineering team originally, I think, um, were a little bit concerned when we started looking initially at the different providers' kind of offerings. The feeling was, well, GCP doesn't really have enough kind of sliders and knobs. We can't really control it. It's a bit of a, a black box. Uh, what we came to realize during those kind of initial concept phases was that actually that's the strength, that a, a huge amount of work has gone on behind the scenes, as Robert alluded to earlier, to make sure that from our point, it is a black box that just kind of works. 
Um, so we've got, you know, the, 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 the controls that are offered to you as a developer are the ones you need rather than just all the ones that they could make available. Um, and that's been a tremendous advantage over time. There have been a couple of occasions where it hasn't quite been enough. Um, so for example, the previous version of Dataflow, which is based on Apache Beam 1, um, didn't allow us to migrate schema on the fly. So we couldn't, as data came in, if the data came in wasn't matching the schema in BigQuery, we basically had to kind of restart the pipeline and, and rebuild. Um, we worked with Google on that, uh, explained the problem, they came up with solutions, and we, we found that uh, we had a solution when Dataflow moved to Beam 2 that will allow us to migrate data on the fly without restarting everything. So there are occasions where it's not quite everything you need, but there that engineering-led culture really made the difference in, in kind of getting us over those hurdles. But in general, having things kind of as a closed box that just works has been tremendously useful. Somebody once made the analogy, um, one of the, the Google sales team, that it's a little bit like you know, Apple consumer products. You think about the iPod uh, when it first came out um, compared to you know, MP3 players at the time. Lots of them had lots of menus and screens and so on. And suddenly Apple comes out with something with a screen and a little wheel and that's it. And it turns out to be the most you know, awesome consumer experience and that's the right thing. So I think there's an awful lot of work that it's easy to overlook that goes on behind the scenes, behind the scenes uh, on the GCP side to make sure that from a you know, consumer's perspective, a consumer of, of the engineering services, that it's what you need. So, uh, to cut a long story short, we partnered with Google. We, um, using their reference architecture, um, built a solution which looks very similar to that. Um, this is ours. If, if you remember the slide that Robert put up earlier, this is a very similar slide. We've got live streaming data coming in from games and some other sources. Uh, we have some on-premise, uh, some other data that's coming in um, in batch. Uh, so in some cases, that's some games that are still sending overnight play logs. Um, we've got other sources of data that are ingested daily, sometimes even less frequently than that. Um, that data is coming in. The batch data goes straight, th basically, into cloud storage, straight through data flow uh, and into BigQuery. Streaming data is published to PubSub, and then Dataflow subscribes to that and captures the data and puts it into BigQuery. On both sides, Dataflow is doing the data validation, augmentation, um, sanitization, and so on. Uh, I'll come on to a couple of other things where we use Dataflow as well, which have, have been kind of nice additional benefits that have really helped us out of a hole with some other problems. Um, and then within, big data, within BigQuery, uh, the data is controlled uh, in terms of access at a project level. So we have a number of projects. We have uh, two projects actually per game um, with different users assigned to each project. And then there are other projects with things like sales data and, and general data sets that go across everything. Uh, and we're able to, to control at quite a fine level who has access to what data and what they need it for. Similarly, on the kind of visualization and reporting side, uh, obviously we've got BigQuery in the middle there. We've got a number of different users. We have general business users, people who basically just need to see KPI dashboards, may be able to drill in or you know, compare this month with last month or something. Um, but they're looking at sort of dashboard level stuff. Uh, we have been using Power BI for that. These days, we're using Data Studio for that much more. Um, when we first started working on this project, Data Studio was, uh, you know, quite frankly, it wasn't, wasn't really there compared to Power BI. Um, it has caught up very rapidly, and we're now very comfortable with Data Studio as a kind of visualization tool at the dashboarding level. Similarly, for Power users who need to slice and dice data a bit more, we were using Tableau. Um, we're now using Looker, another Google partner, which allows people to basically do the same sort of things they would use in Tableau to be able to slice and dice the data and do more complex things than they can do in Data Studio without having to get down and dirty with SQL queries. Um, and then, of course, we have data scientists. Uh, we've got some of them. You haven't got all of them, but we've got a few. Um, and they are using traditional data scientist tools. We've got Jupyter Notebooks with uh, you know, Python scripts. Uh, and they are writing SQL, and then we do have you know, a little bit of Cloud ML and, and TensorFlow as well. Um, and those guys are able to, to get access to the data in the way that you've just seen uh, Robert demonstrate. So, one final concern. I mentioned earlier the um, kind of data governance side of things. Um, remember, this has been going on over the last couple of years, and if you cast your mind back to this time last year, 
everybody was very concerned about GDPR. We'd actually been on our side planning for that for about 18 months before last May, uh, making sure that we were prepared for, for the, you know, the additional kind of burdens that were going to come to us. We had a number of requirements that the old system couldn't meet. Um, in particular, uh, it was very difficult for us to uh, respond to a subject access request. If somebody wanted to know from us all the data that we held on them, if you remember, it was very, very fragmented with lots of people, lots of data, uh, and it was very difficult for us to pull all of that together and return somebody a kind of readable file with, here's all the information we have on you. It was possible, but it meant a lot of phone calls and CSV files being copied around, and no, we forgot to ask Fred in you know, IT. Um, also, uh, we could opt out of things like email marketing and so on, but we weren't easily able to stop collecting uh, an individual's data. Um, and another requirement under GDPR is that you can collect the data, but you can't process it. So you're not allowed to use it for you know, targeted marketing and so on. And that's something we couldn't do before either. And finally, uh, you have the right to have data that you can prove is incorrect, amended, or to ask that your data is completely deleted. And both of those we couldn't really do. The Hadoop-based approach we had before, the data was pretty much write-only from our point of view. Um, so if we'd had to remove a user's data, we would have had to copy all but that data to a new data set, drop the old. It was just cumbersome and, and not really operationally feasible. So we had a bunch of challenges that we had a you know, legal obligation to comply with um, that our old system couldn't meet. Um, that actually was the thing that tipped this over the edge. So the data science team had wanted something like this in place for a long time to make their lives easier. GDPR was the thing that finally gave us the business driver. We're going to have to spend some money. We're going to have to do a bunch of work to, to get to where we need to be. Why not just build a system we know that we need, um, we know that we want, um, rather than just try and patch up the old system in some way. If we have to spend the money anyway, why not spend it in the right place rather than just spending it patching up an old system? Um, so the new system, all the data is in one place. Implicitly, we have pointers to where it came from. So if we do need to find additional sources for deletion or something, we can. Remember, all the data ends up in SGV, but that's not necessarily the only place. There are operational databases that will have other copies. Um, and uh, also, we're able to increase the level of governance we've got around our data. So um, one of the things that we have been able to do is to separate data which contains PII and to provide additional views of that data with the PII masked. Now, some people will re need the real raw PII. You know, imagine customer service. If someone phones up and says, hey, look, I've paid for this item in game and I didn't get it in my inventory, customer service need to actually have the PII to, to speak to that person, verify they are who they are, go into their game inventory, figure out what they've got, and resolve the problem. But most people don't need actual customer data. They just need to know, for example, that these players are unique or that they can do a, a, you know, a join across tables. Um, and make sure that you know, this gameplay data is matched with that identity data without knowing who that person actually is. So the way we did that is uh, I mentioned that we have two game projects, uh, two projects within BigQuery for each game. What we have is one which contains the raw data, which is very locked down and to which very few people have access. And then we have another which has an identical set of schema, but the... Uh, any PII columns in the original data are represented by hashed versions of that PII. So it's unique, uh, but it's not personally identifiable unless you know what that hash function is. And the hash function is rotated every week automatically. So from our point of view, even if somebody takes an extract and has a, a snapshot of what that mapping is, in a few days it's going to be obsolete. So we're limiting our, our risk. There's not zero risk. You can't, you know, you have to live with some level of risk, assuming you're not going to completely distrust everybody in your company to work with data. Uh, but we're able to manage the risk appropriately. People that need the data have access to it. People that don't need the data, we're able to, to kind of protect them, to be honest, from having to worry too much about it. So, on to the results. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, four um, experiments that we've, we've run with the data since we started. The first is targeting some Facebook ads um, for uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. So what we did here, and this is some, uh, and phenomenal work, uh, my team worked on the, the actual 
um, segmentation and the lookalike audience piece. Uh, the analytics and insights team built the actual segments. Um, the marketing team at IDOS Montreal did a fantastic job in, in the creative that we'll have a look at in a minute. And what we did was we identified six segments um, in our two, this is Rise of the Tomb Raider, this is the previous version of the game, previous iteration. We looked at the data that we had for gameplay of Rise of the Tomb Raider. We segmented that user base using a number of attributes, we'll look at them in a minute. Um, and then we had a number of different creatives. We had six 30 second TV spots um, that we used. We combined that with a bunch of different um, copy lines as well for different calls to action. Um, and we multivariate, it says AB tested here, it's actually multivariate testing um, to find out which creatives resonated best with which um, segments of the audience. So these are roughly speaking the the six kinds of players that we identified. Um, we've given them all uh, kind of nicknames, veteran, action junkie, solver, dabbler, completionist, and trialist. Um, there are obviously numeric uh, values underneath this um, that we're using to produce those segmentations. Um, it's not a straight binary slice in three dimensions. We've got actually a number of different um, attributes here. Th there's a kind of cluster analysis process going on. Um, some of these are obvious. We've got things like gameplay and, and you know, hours of gameplay, um, completion, percentage completion, and things like that. Some of those obvious, you know, if you look at these, these descriptions on screen, um, you can tell what some of those were. There are others that are a little bit more um, sophisticated. So, for example, uh, Action Junkie takes risks frequently, attempting challenging obstacles. Um, that's uh, one of the measures that contributes to that. None of these are simple, they're all kind of combined measures, but one of the measures that contributes to that is uh, what the UK legal system calls death by misadventure. So if, if Lara doesn't make a jump or falls off a cliff edge or drowns or you know, is killed other than by an NPC, then we regard that as you know, adrenaline-fueled you know, lust for challenge or something. So that's something, the, the percentage death by NPC versus kind of environmental catastrophe um, is something that code, codes for action junkie. So you've got those different segments there. And uh, what we've done is the team have put together six, as I said, six, six 30 second spots. They're not a one-to-one -one match for those six segments. Um, that happen to be six in each, that's kind of coincidence. Um, these spots, I've got, I'm not gonna show all of them, but we've got uh, a 10 second clip for each of them at the moment uh, that I'll show you. Um, things to watch out for when you look at, there's a little um, caption, we can say it says TV spot on the right here, that tells you kind of what the theme of, of that clip is. Um, they've also got very different music and different feel to them. Um, so if we run through that, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about it in a second. Do you realize the tragedy you have unleashed? What have I done? Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. By taking the key, you set the apocalypse in motion. So you can see we've got a number of different clips there. Um, they've all got a very different look and feel. Some are darker, some are lighter. Some have got you know, more upbeat music than others. Uh, there are some which have dialogue and focus on the character or the storyline, others which focus on stunts and things like that. Um, and the idea was to look at the, the segments we had of the different types of data and basically to match those clips and figure out which resonated better. Uh, and then also, as I said earlier, the, the, the copyright the copy lines that we had on the ads as well. Um, and 
me one second. Oops. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> the one thing we couldn't get working. Thanks. So, uh, to cut straight to the results, we found that the segmented ads, on, bet on average, uh, the segmented campaigns performed twice as well as the unsegmented campaign. So we had some benchmark campaigns that we'd run before where we'd addressed pretty much the same audience with the same creative, but with the same creative across the whole audience. Um, the click-through rate uh, was on average about literally almost exactly double um, across all of these campaigns combined. Some performed even better than that. Uh, some a little bit worse than, than double, but the, the average was double, so we're really happy with that. The other way of looking at it, of course, is cost per click. Um, so we've either doubled our click-through rate or halved our marketing costs to the same number of clicks. Um, so phenomenally successful from our point of view. Um, again, this is you know early days, but the early indications of what we're able to do with the data that we couldn't before have been really useful. Remember before we had that siloed data, um, we weren't able, for example, to take the siloed data and match that to Facebook data to build Facebook audiences, um, which we could now. Um, next, uh, this may not look, uh, you may not be able to see the detail on this, but ba basically this is the uh, Kingdom Hearts website. Uh, Kingdom Hearts came out earlier this year, um, and we had the, the website user journey there, um, which is fairly traditional. We've got a, a straight landing page, um, and then there's a, you know, user journey you can imagine going through the history of the franchise, details about this particular game, and then a buy now page. Um, this was built by the, the team in LA, um, did a fantastic job on the website, but what we wanted to do was try and make sure that we were getting maximum use out of that. Um, and again, looking at the, uh, segmenting the, the audience for that, we've got sources of data for people who were completely new to the franchise where starting on the landing page and stepping through that journey is the right thing to do. We have other people who have got a high kind of purchase intent already that dropping them straight into the buy page is the right thing to do. Uh, but equally, if you get that the wrong way around, the last thing you want to do is take somebody who's ready to buy and bore them by taking them through a whole history of the franchise that they already know. Um, or for somebody who doesn't really know much that has just heard about this Pixar thing that we've done and wants to, you know, maybe they've picked up some marketing um, on the Disney side of things and doesn't know much about the game. Um, dropping them straight on a buy now page feels really abrupt. So what we did was look at the sources of the traffic, analyze previous kind of right route results from those sources, um, and then have the, uh, the basically the consumer dropped into that user journey from those ads at what we felt was the right place for them. Um, and this performed even better than the Tomb Raider campaign. We got uh, click-through rates increased by 144% here. Um, click-throughs to, to retailer links, and overall conversion increased by 20%. Um, so again, really happy with the results from that side. Um, a couple of others that I'll touch on very briefly before we talk about next steps. Um, we, uh, with Life is Strange 2, which is an episodic game, we localized into a lot more languages than we did for Life is Strange 1. Life is Strange 2, we saw that we had users in new markets like Russia and so on, um, but the game itself wasn't localized into those languages. So for two, we localized into those languages. And what we wanted to do is measure the effectiveness of, that, effectiveness of that. We can't necessarily just look at sales data and say we sold double the number of units. We need to look at other data as well, user data, um, where people are playing the game, um, correlating that with purchase. Because obviously there will be, you know, in different markets, uh, other than th there are sources of, of you know, gameplay other than people just buying their own copy. There's lots of second hand, there's piracy and so on as well. So understanding that helped us really um, figure out how we were gonna optimize our marketing, our, uh, sorry, localization spends in future. Um, so what we, having done this, what we found is that uh, that localization effort, having analyzed the data using the data in BigQuery, we can find that we've got, uh, in some countries, double the share of users uh, for this version than we had previously. So that's share, not absolute numbers. So the indication there is that localizing to those languages um, has really had an impact on increasing take up in those countries. Um, and finally, 
timing analysis for episodic games. Um, this is something that we're doing at the moment, the work's ongoing, but what we're trying to do is look at improving our sales forecasting and eventually get to the point where we can actually um, control our sales curve to some extent um, by affecting the timing of episodic releases. For some games, some players will be super excited about a game and uh, pre-order a, you know, a release. Um, for other games, they may play the first episode and then buy a season pass to enjoy the rest once they're sort of bought in. They're treating the first episode as a kind of you know, trial. Um, player C there, maybe those people are buying the collector's edition at the end, uh, or perhaps they, you know, maybe they've played the whole game, maybe they haven't, but they've, they're buying much later in the sequence. Uh, but then you've got potentially player D, which is a group we didn't get at all, who maybe played the, the initial free first episode and then just dropped out of the process entirely. So understanding what that looks like, um, how those, those player bases segment out, um, and how the timing of those releases affects that is something we're doing at the moment in order to improve not only our forecasting in the short term, but long term, the ability to actually control that, uh, that sales pipeline. So, some basic uh, examples there. I think, um, as we said, we've now got to a situation where there's a lot more experimentation going on. A lot of those constraints that we mentioned earlier have gone away. Uh, we've been really happy with the results that we've got from the platform. We've got a really solid relationship with the, the GCP team uh, where we feel we're getting a lot of support where we need it um, and you know, fantastic tech to build on. Um, we have um, worked on a number of the challenges that we had, for example, the, the schema migration um, and got great results there. We have a happy, smiling DPO. Um, I would have shown you a picture, but that's PII and I'm not allowed to do it without written consent. So. Um, but we, we're comfortable now that we're a lot more secure than we were in, in our kind of governance around the data. Um, and this is the first real cloud native application that we've built. We had um, infrastructure in public cloud before. We had web servers deployed on Kubernetes in different environments, um, but we hadn't really taken the leap and built anything cloud native. And what we were doing really is, is infrastructure as a service, so it was effectively just not paying for the hardware capex. Um, but this is you know, the first time that we've really got into that and it's been incredibly successful. Um, so what's next for us in terms of the single game of view platform? Uh, well, to torture the Pokemon analogy, we've got some legendary data sources that we still wanna catch. Um, there are some games which aren't yet in this system for, for various reasons and we're you know, having got these initial proof points we're now able to kind of bring some of those data sources in and open up those conversations. Um, a year in, we've also got uh, some good use cases where we can justify automating um, or building further tooling around the platform. So things like uh, we mentioned earlier, the ability to filter users and to either capture or not capture data um, or to process or not process data. Um, and having that process automated uh, and API driven is something that we're, we're working on at the moment. Uh, we're looking at a cross-platform cross segmentation framework, so the sort of segmentation that we did for Tomb Raider, we're able to have those segments. At the moment, those segments are kind of extracted out and then used to build um, audience lists for Facebook and so on. Um, with the cross-platform segmentation framework, what we're intending to do is have the segmentations native to the system itself so that we can pass them around as kind of first class objects within the, the architecture. And finally, the, uh, all the examples I've given here have been sort of marketing related or maybe sales analysis related. The reason for that is, is twofold. First of all, um, my team's responsible for most of those websites and stores and so on. So it's within our team's ability to, to do those controls. We work very closely with the analytics team uh, and between the two of us, we're able to do this without too much additional kind of buy-in. Um, but the other thing, obviously, is that the dev cycle on, on a marketing campaign is weeks or months at most. Uh, the dev cycle on a game is months or years. And so uh, it was going to be much quicker for us to get those kind of proof points um, by working on marketing campaigns to show the idea, the kind of proof of concept of what we want to do with user data and segmentation. Um, but the next step for us is then closing that loop and starting to use that data from BigQuery natively in games to do personalization and so on within the game itself rather than outside the game. And what's next? So that's what's next for the, for the SGV platform. 
Uh, what's next for Square Enix in general? Well, we are deploying um, game servers on GTP um, for some multiplayer titles coming up, uh, which is going to generate a lot of data. <coughs> we are also deploying a lot of the back-end services, so our identity systems, billing systems, um, store sales, and so on are being deployed in GCP as well. Um, again, it's going to generate a lot of data. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally, we're scaling up analytics pipeline, the, the SGP platform itself, to be able to cope with much larger portions of data. Um, fortunately, of those three pillars, that's the easiest for us because that's something that pretty much is handled entirely by Google. Um, so the scaling side of it is something that is no longer uh, a big challenge for us. We just have to write a slightly bigger check. That's fine. Um, and that's it. Um, I don't think we can have time for questions. I've left my email address there. Um, feel free to get in touch if you've got any questions or come up afterwards. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much. <laughs>